You're listening to Real Investor Radio with Craig Fuhr and Jack Bevere, where we cover advanced real estate investing topics to help you stay ahead of the curve in your real estate investing business. Hey, welcome back to Real Investor Radio. I'm Craig Fuhr, joined again by Jack Bevere of the Dominion Group and Real Investor Roundtable. Jack, good to see you. Absolutely. You too, sir. You too. Well, let's just jump right in. Uh, if uh, folks are listening in right now and you haven't had a chance to go back to the first episode with Neil Timmons from Legacy Impact Investors, I would highly encourage everybody to listen to that. Neil has uh, quite a story over the last 20 years of starting out in residential real estate, single family, having a lot of success there, and then made the pivot as so many real estate investors do, Jack, into different asset classes. I think there's always this lore of like, well, I've, I've conquered that arena in single family and I just want to start doing things that maybe have more zeros, a little bit more financial impact, um, you know, better tax structures. And so, Neil, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time in a second episode with us. And I hope everybody enjoys this one. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So we left off on the last episode of your pivot into commercial. Um, first building that you bought was a 17,000 square foot industrial building. We talked about a strip center that you purchased. We touched briefly on uh, self-storage that you've got and uh, you not one of your favorite assets, evidently. And then um, we also touched briefly on um, that you own a mobile home park as well. Um, so let's just jump off there. Jack, why don't you take us away here? Yeah. So walk, walk me through the learning curve of these different assets. Like, how did you like, you know, just knowing what you don't know, like you, you doing a bunch of reading to do this, you, you go into someone's course to like get, get, you know, to get, do a boot camp on a particular asset class. And then you figure it out from there. Like walk me through throwing down deposit, get into that. Mm. Hey, my EMD goes hard tomorrow and I'm going to let it happen. Like, in, in in each of those asset classes, like how yeah. do you make the, how do you make those pivots? An industrial building's got got four walls and there's a lease in place, and it and it's just simply as what am I responsible for? A roof and exterior structure, and that's it. Tenant takes care of absolutely everything else. So in fact, compared to a house, I have way less responsibility associated with it, and then it's just budgeting for that to go. What's what's it look like? It's so for me, it's yes, it's understanding. It really getting a really good understanding is where's my exposure, where's my risk, where can this go wrong, and is it is it that complicated or not? And I think some of that is it's not some of the asset classes, industrial being one of them. It's not that complicated. Mm. There's just not there's not that many moving pieces. Retail is a different story. You got retail fronts, and all, and all, there's just a whole bunch of different things that go into retail. It, the management side is way more involved than a retail side of things, which is why I brought a third-party property manager in for uh, the strip mall that we acquired to allow them to take care of all of it mm -hmm. uh, because it's because it's more involved. But same thing, just go through the lease and, and go through it all. Understand um, that in buying deep enough cures all ales, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, any asset, right? So buying deep enough. And so part of that is on as I went through some of these, especially early on, I was going, okay, well, I got to be deep enough because I, I, I can account for what I think I can account for when I know, but I also need to account for what I don't know and what I'm not yeah. sure of. Right. Yeah. And so that that's part of it. Um, were you, were you buying deep yeah. enough on as is value at that time where you were like, Hey, I'm buying this for a million and yeah. I know it's worth a million five. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, it's yeah, not not that not two. that you bought yeah. it for a million five and you're like, hey, this seems like a decent deal, and then it went up to two or two and a half. No, it's that you were, you were getting a deal at the time, and that yeah. and well, that was you, the I, warm blanket. Uh, let me give you a case study. How about that? So uh, uh, this is the only one I bought uh, that has been on market. All right, so came to market. So it was a four pack of properties, orthodontist, uh, orthodontist properties, right? Three of the properties, single tenant. Fourth property, strip mall, orthodontist has one of the spots and there's like seven other tenants. And so very early on that fourth property with the strip mall got taken out of the portfolio. They had problems with it. So it came out. So there's three properties left. And you've got one property that is the showcase property of this whole thing. It's worth um, ballparking 75% of the value of the whole portfolio. Hmm. And then you got these, these two other ones. Mm -hmm. And so everybody wanted the nice one. 
And I was, so all, the seller only wanted to sell the whole package. They didn't want to have anything to do with piecemealing this thing off. So they got a bunch of offers in for one property and I offered on the whole thing, the whole kit and caboodle. My contingency was I get to assign the values for all three properties. So I, I assigned the values to all three properties. And then what I did was take the, the most valuable one and I figured out who was offering on it because the broker network is small and they talk and I wholesaled that off to the, to the buyer. Mm -hmm. And then I retained the other two properties, which I closed on. And because I could assign the values in such a way that uh, I ended up paying a, a million and a half total for the two properties that I took down. It appraised the day of closing at two and a half million. Mm -hmm. And so my lender financed a hundred percent of the deal. I went to closing with no money down. Local bank again. Yep. Yep. That is the nice thing about those local, those local balance sheets where you just Correct. have to convince them, you know, they'll do some off market shit, which is great. I mean, at some point you got a million dollar spread. I mean, how much, how much yeah. more, what do you, yeah. how much more comfort level do you need? Right. That's super interesting. Do you think that you those still, do you think that those, those same lenders would do that structure today or uh, has even the game like become so much more prevalent that, that like that, you know, can it be done today? You know, can it be done today? Maybe is my answer. That particular bank I borrowed a lot from. They know me extraordinarily well. In fact, they were the first bank I ever borrowed a dollar from when I started flipping houses. Um, so they were, they were, they were the first. So they've, they've known me for lots of years and know how I execute. No, we've never had a problem. No, I do what I say. You know, when, when uh, COVID came around, uh, there was a whole bunch of people calling their bank, getting forbearances, right? Mm -hmm. It seemed like everybody called the bank, get a forbearance, just kick the can down the road. I took the opposite approach. Uh, I, I thought COVID was going to be a tremendous opportunity to buy. And I thought it was an opportunity to strengthen relationships. So I called all my lenders and said, just so you know, I'm not asking for a forbearance. I'm going to pay you on time every time, every single month. Mm -hmm. We're going to work through this just fine. So yeah. I just wanted you to know that I'm going to do the opposite. I'm not asking for anything. Yeah. You know that, um, that phrase, um, you know, it never hurts to ask. I couldn't disagree more. I completely disagree. I think often it hurts tremendously to ask because it colors you in the eyes of the person that you're asking. And though I understand the point of the question is that, hey, you got to take your shot. But like if you're asking for some egregious shit, though, and you think that it doesn't blow back on your reputation, I just completely disagree with you. So how, long you, you how, how long are you playing the game for? The game's to be played yeah. forever till you go out. Feed first. We had we had the same same we had a, a bunch of borrowers who like called during COVID and you know they were like hey you just wanted to call about your forbearance program we're like hey buddy we're private like we ain't got one like you know when when, when they call us and start forbearing our debt we'll let you know but it, you know at the moment I'm I'm not counting on it so don't hold your breath and then but we'd also have folks who they would call their lenders that did have forbearance uh, opportunities right like where it was just like a program you just had to call and ask and they would do it. But then the problem was like, they, yeah, they gave it to you, but they did put that in the file, right? Like they, they did make a note of that. And then when those guys tried to refi nine months later, they're like, ah, you've got a forbearance within the past 18 months. Like, I'm sorry, you're not eligible for a refinance. And now they're like, oh, I, did, I didn't know. It. We're like, yeah, buddy. Like, hey, dumbass, like you didn't need it. You shouldn't have been, you shouldn't have made the call in the first place. It was a, it was a greedy thing to do and you're getting banged for it because you know, you, uh, you, you damaged your reputation. I, I, I yeah. much bigger fan of your approach of calling and being like, Hey, I'm the, I'm, I'm the one I'm calling to let you know that I'm super solid. And if anything goes yeah. sideways, you know, I'm your man. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what's your, um, in, in your, so you've, you've bought, you've bought industrial, you bought self-storage, you bought, yeah. t talk to me about the mobile homes, man. Like, yeah, like that's, that's a look at, in my opinion, that's like a look them in the whites of the eyes, pick up cash business. Like, are you doing that? Or like you had a manager who's doing that? We bought a m mobile home park two years ago. How many uh, units? How many units? How many? 30, pads? 36 pads. Tenant owned or park owned? Um, there was, do we, I think we had one, one park owned. And mm -hmm. then the rest all 10 on. Fantastic. Right? Yes. About, it's in Dubuque, about three hours away from where I sit here. And we bought this property. And my intent was to wholesale this off, actually, when we bought it. And so we we would, we went under contract uh, two, maybe three times with end buyers. And every one of them crapped out. 
And so we finally get down to the end. You're like, what? We think we got a winner here, but I don't, we can't, nobody's closing on this thing. And so the idea, the decision ultimately was made to go, all right, well, let's go figure it out. So I, you know, I used to use my own money and go, all right, well, let's, I, I think we got something and it feels like it works. So let's go execute a plan and let's go, then we'll, we'll go full cycle on it. So went in uh, immediately, rents were like, I don't know, 50 or 60% below market. We immediately mm. raised rents like 40% or 38% like day one, right? Give them the notice. Everybody that was made- on a month. Everybody was on a month. Yeah. You know what, Craig? Not one person complained. Not, there was not a single complaint, which tells me we didn't raise it enough. All right. <laughs> so- so let me uh, let me get the let me get the see if I can get the avatar of the uh, of the park owner, seventy five year old gray haired guy. Kids didn't want it, you know. They, they're looking at it as an albatross. Everybody thinks there's a stigma to uh, to yeah, mobile home parks. They're obviously not building any more of them though. Right. And so, w- did I nail the avatar right on the seller? Oh, oh the seller, yeah. yeah. He was like at, right at the end of he uh, drawing down his parks mismanaged naturally didn't he wanted it easy so that's why these rents were so far under market right mm-hmm. he didn't How live there he was he was he was out of town or not far i mean he was 10 miles away sure yeah how big is this uh, how big is the asset what was that purchase price five something 522 i think Five hundred twenty thousand. yeah 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 sweet deal we had a private private sewer system we have a lagoon so Jack, I had to get educated on what in the world a lagoon was. <laughs> and that was the scariest. That, uh, out of all the purchases, that's been the scariest piece because you have a private sewer system, um, literally a, a poop pond. Actually, we had two. And it has to be, it's overseen by the state. You got to, I mean, you're complying with all these regulations. So we brought the right guy in, literally the guy in the town next door who manages the city's sewer system, had a private business. And so he managed our sewer system. I was like, all right, we got the right dude. Uh, but in my mind, lagoons are our time bomb, just waiting to go yeah. off. That's going to cost you a hundred or $200,000 to solve. Mm-hmm. And then we had well water. Well water uh, requires daily testing. Right next to the lagoon, by the way, Jack. Right, like- daily testing? Daily testing of water. How do you so like that's what, so? What's the expense ratio on this? Like, yeah, how do you how do you underwrite that? You're spending five hundred and twenty two thousand dollars on an asset. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's like a mid sized house. You know, like correct. early. <laughs> yeah, correct. Yeah, um, so we, yeah, we put like the major metro the, suburban house. Like, yeah, correct. Like all the operating stuff that goes into this yeah. and like like that could go real 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 sideways. Yeah, like real real well, quick. Man- Management consisted of not much. We had everybody sign leases. We had a financial collection in my office here in town. It's either ACH or you're going to mail a check. There's no cash getting picked up. Mm. If you have a problem, you can call our office. Uh, but we don't own any of the homes. We'll make sure it's it's the, the mowing is done, the snow's done. Other than that, that's about it. It was a very clean, very neat park. Not There wasn't much to it. What are pad rents? They were two hundred eighty dollars when we bought it, and we moved it to three eighty five. Still what, cheap. What Still are your cheap. expense ratio? Like, what's your expenses? How much? How much of the, that three eighty five gets spent on expenses? Mm, good question. I'm going off memory here because we can't yeah, 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 cycle yeah. on it. Um, we had a on site. I call him park park manager. I use that in quotes because he was he mowed and he t- tested the water daily, and mm. then he posted notices when my office would email him notices to post. So that's not really a management. I mean, it's like light, right? Pretty, so he pretty got, typical. Pretty typical. Yeah. He got rent for free and then we paid him like 300 bucks a month. That was it. Hmm. Other than that, you are into taxes, insurance, mowing or, or snow. And, and you just, and you just like figure the, it out. You're just like, hey, I'm going to figure it out. You know, yeah, you're, yeah. you're digging in there figuring it out. <laughs> so figure it out, solved everything in about mm, 90 days, listed it for sale, sold it for 975000 Really? Why did you, so why did you think you had a winner? How did you know that you had a winner? And this, and, wh- and where'd you source this deal? Was this a postcard? Yeah, it was a postcard. Uh, what made me think we had a winner is because we went under contract with three different people for north of $800,000. None of them closed, mm. of course, but I was going, there's enough demand. It seems like the market's there. There, if we go in and solve these problems, leave some meat on the bone for somebody, 
it seems like taking this out to market at a nine cap, somebody should love this deal. Yeah. Let me ask you this on the uh, avatar of that buyer. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, mobile home parks are sort of in that same fragmented state uh, as a market that Jack was all fo foamy about uh, back in 2004 or seven, I should say. And um, while you have A and B class properties being purchased by Berkshire Hathaway and, and Sun and guys like that, I still think that there's a tremendously fragmented market amongst the 55,000 parks across the United States. And so I could see where um, your, your postcard would work in cases like that. And, you know, strangely enough, Jack, there's no great list to go out and find all 55,000 parks. It's, sure. it's very, very difficult to find. If you want to be a guy in that market, you're literally going on to Crexy or LoopNet or just Google and trying to, you know, find the parks uh, with Google Maps. But trying to find the owner is, is heavy lifting in most cases. So this person who came to you to buy the property, Neil, is this a person who owned several other parks or were they new in, in the market? Like, you know, tell me about that. California money. <laughs> they, they work for, they work for a, uh, a syndication. In my understanding is they work for a syndication who had uh, closed and owned dozens of parks and they were pers they were an employee there and they wanted to do some stuff on, on their own or on the side, if you will, mm -hmm. kind of the stuff that the syndication would never buy. It's too small. And so, stumbled across across this uh online somehow you know one of the one of the outlets and that's how they showed up yeah it's not an easy market um in the smaller parks the the you know tertiary right. secondary markets to get to get any sort of agency financing on or you know and and frankly most municipalities are you know they're they're pretty lukewarm to having parks uh these days just because uh, you know they don't they don't throw off a lot, whole lot of property taxes and so, um, you know, I, I still think it's a, it's a really interesting asset class and I'm just, I'm curious, you know, are you looking for any more of these? Do, do you like well, the asset class or? We have got another one under contract right now. In fact, we just, uh, presented to investors yesterday. We're set to close in about three weeks on this 70, 73 pads of which 62 are occupied. So about twice the size of the one I just mentioned to you here in, here in Des Moines. So right in my backyard, literally. 20 minutes from where I sit here. Um, another, I mean, value add as it gets, right? Mismanaged for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And so there is, uh, there's a few things that are really low hanging fruit. So I'm, I'm excited for, for this one. It's going to be, it's going to be an interesting one and fun one to, to execute on. A lot of people like to talk uh, about the similarities between self storage and mobile home parks, sort of that low, uh, low cost of operation, um, you know, you don't really have a whole lot of uh, um, interaction with tenants. You know, they just kind of pay the pad rent and you're good. So on this particular asset that you're just talking about, mm -hmm. are these also tenant owned properties or park owned? Yeah, out of 62, there are six park owned, four of which are sold on contract. One, the manager lives in and the sixth is vacant. So that'll that'll get updated and sold out. Mm -hmm. Jump in, Jack. You mentioned that you're going to syndicate this one. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, and you've done some other syndications. What's that? What's that experience been like? How how, you're, how you know how have syndications been going? What kind of stuff did you syndicate? Why, uh, as yeah. opposed to taking it down yourself? Oh, it's been terrible. Tell us the <laughs> tell us the there, here's, here's why. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, first I want to say this, and then I'll go down to why. Um, success in real estate and success in syndications, raising capital, are not the same. They're not even correlated. That's my belief. Uh, just because you're good at one doesn't mean you're good at the other. Because I know we, Jack, we both know lots of people who are really good at raising money. They wouldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't make a dime if you gave it to them in real estate because they're not real estate operators. So, so when you say syndications are going poorly, the raising money part is yes, going poorly, yes, or the real yes. estate part yeah. is going poorly. No, the real estate's going great. Yeah, <laughs> the raising money's going poorly. Yeah, it's funny if you go on Facebook. I've been like scrolling around on like Facebook groups recently, yeah. and like. There's there's like this there's like this simmer that's going on underneath right now because like no one's talking about it. No one's talking about how their syndications have gone, right? Like there was all these multifamily syndications specifically, but also other asset classes going as well, right? And then 
But then if someone posts something about a syndication and like how it's, they've got a situation that's not going very well or like, hey, how are, you know, anybody, any feedback on what, what's going on with their multifamily syndications? 53 comments, like, like just, just hate and, and, you know, and huh. like, you know, hate and anger and anxiety and shame, just like all over the board, like just like spouts up like a little volcano. Um, but, but then you don't see any of these projects. So, you know, if, if I, I get, you know, and, and I love these Facebook groups because it's like what people are actually feeling, right? Like you actually yeah. get a sense of what's going on on main street much more than reading anything in the news or wherever, you know, like they don't have a fucking clue. Right. Um, but like, if you go on the Facebook groups, you have real people talking about what's actually going on. So I, it's great. Um, and, but, but none of those properties have like shown up in the market yet. Right. So you're to your point you mentioned previously about like getting ready for buying opportunities. Uh, I feel like the grumblings are like elevated, like, like the volume is coming up on that it has not yet burst through in terms of like actual inventory hitting the market yet, but it makes me start, start to want to pay attention so that I, as they start to pop up, will be ready. Right. And not like starting the learning curve from zero as soon as there are like things hitting the market. Um, so it's funny cause like all those folks off, you know, all these like fancy, uh, marketing guys or, you know, good, you know, good at marketing guys, good at networking. <laughs> have been doing shit jobs on the real estate side it seems Correct. yeah um no obviously yeah, our, real estate, our, market, our real estate but... our real estate's been doing well and as we on you know as we roll in from where this is our third syndication money's coming from those who invested in deal one and deal two because mm. the deals are going well and so we expand the network from the people who are already in our deals already already in, already having success right um and so that's where that's really it's becoming more of a groundswell if you will from from friends, family referrals from the people who are in the deal. So it's a testament to the real estate side of things. It's just, it, it is a new avenue of business for us to go off and ask for money and to get engaged with investors. It's just very different than executing our real estate things. It's a totally different business. Is it? And you're doing it because the deals are bigger, big enough size that you're no. like, I don't, we don't even need the money. This, uh, this is, we haven't done a deal yet where we've taken money from investors. Um, where, and I've, I've always said this to be true. If I put a deal in front of you, it's because I know I love this deal and I'll do the deal without you. Mm -hmm. And so if no investors show up, we'll still do it. You know, it's just going to be Neil writing a much bigger check to get over the finish line. The goal of this is to build a network of investors so mm -hmm. that we've got people there when the deal does come down the pipeline that is too big for me to write a check for that I've got resources and I'm not trying to figure it out that day. Mm -hmm. I want to solve for this as we go with, with these smaller deals, with successful deals and, and prove ourselves so that we can, we can build a network and build a reputation of success for investors. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those, you know, real, real, you know, real foundation there for fundraising is, is an organic one, right? That's the authentic. Correct. One. The folks who like put out the fancy glossy stuff and bring in a bunch of folks and then the deal doesn't go well. And then they're the ones who are just roasting your ass, right? Cause they have no actual relationship with you. Right. It was correct. Purely based off of gloss and greed. So like, yeah, I think, I, mean, Jack, I, I feel way, like, I, right? I feel like I've met so many syndicators over the past, I don't know, call it eight years that the, the guiding philosophy was, let me get really, really good at marketing for money. Um, I'll be, I'm still trying to figure out the whole, uh, the asset that I'm operating in, but I'm going to be um, rescued by the appreciation in the market. So I'm probably not buying a, the best deal, but we're going to do some value add. And in three to five years, I'm going to exit this thing and make a shit ton of money. Um, I always looked at that as sort of crystal ball investing. You know, I, I think that appreciation should be the bonus, the cherry on, on the cake rather than, you know, of all the returns of real estate. And so I, I think it's a refreshing thing, Neil, to hear guys like you who are, who understand the real estate side better, and you'll figure out the capital raising side as you, as you go along, but you're still right. putting out great deals that are, you know, on paper, uh, you know, feasible rather than. Oh, I've got to worry about what the market does in terms of appreciation and really make money on this thing. I, I agree with you, and that's that's probably because I sit in Iowa, right? It's got to be cash flow first, yeah, and not and not uh, not banking on the appreciation to make the deal, right? Yeah. When we when we um so Fred started Dominion in two thousand two, and 
in 2003, he started lending his own money. And then in 2003, he started bringing in some friends and family money. And it was always an organic, you know, meet people at Thanksgiving and, you know, and they would, you know, a hundred would trickle in, 50 would trickle in, 200 would trickle in and like just a slow, slowly organically grew it. And then 2000. 10 2011 we get introduced to the the atlanta market and we're like this is freaking awesome like like these houses are so cheap but the but the mentality right like throughout the world was that you shouldn't touch real estate with a 10-foot pole we may have overbuilt for 50 years we may have, we may never build houses ever again blah 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 right like um which has all been proved to be total bullshit but the uh and so in 2011 we started buying houses in atlanta with our own money and then in 2012 we're like dude we should raise some we should go past the hat like this is a much bigger opportunity and we should go raise some money for that and so we went on this big road you know road trip you know fundraising campaign opened up the whole rolodex spent a bunch of money on marketing to try to raise money and we got fucking crickets everywhere we went just no, everyone thought we were idiots. We got, we'd go to these meetings with, you know, financial advisors and they would just pat us on the head and be like, you know, maybe you should spend that energy. It sounds like you guys really know what you're talking about. Maybe you should spend that energy in real estate education. And that just pissed us off. Right. Um, but the people who threw down were all from that buildup of from 2003 mm. to 2011 in the lending company who we had been giving we we had been giving checks to every month for you know every month for nine years those folks all threw down because of that track record with us and that was it right we said hey you should do this we think it's a good idea they say hey you've never let us wrong before and they all threw down and they all made a bunch of money because you know because of you know because they did throw down at the right time right. and everybody else you know everybody else couldn't raise money right because when there's a real opportunity when you really need the money because yeah. there's a real opportunity to do it the that that like that surface level marketing glossy fundraising crowd ain't there right they ain't going to throw down when yep. when there's a real opportunity so i'm sure that it's the the harder path but the one that's actual like has value the what what you're doing there so we're confident in it. It's just taking, uh, it, it, it's just, a, it's always more work and more, more effort, but, uh, the, the conversations we're having and the relationships we're building, um, you're right. They, they, I'm like, we, there's some depth to it. So Neil, for the listeners, um, and, and Jack, I have to believe that there's, there's guys that guys and gals that listen to the podcast who, you know, they've, they've reached a certain scale. They, they're looking for more capital. They're, figuring out uh, how to do the pitch to friends, family, and fools, as my mentor used to say. And um, Neil, maybe you can, we, we talked about case studying. Uh, let's, let's talk about like this particular mobile home park that you're looking at purchase price. Yep. You know, what do you think you're going to do for value add in, in, yep. in addition to raising rents? And then what is the, what's your vision for going out and raising the capital for it? How much are you looking to raise? Even though you, you, by your own admission, you, you can pay for the thing yourself, but yeah. I think you have a real vision for, um, putting a network of investors together who can, right. you know, leverage their, their capital through you. So, yeah. 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 So this one, uh, purchase price 1.2 million, it appraised at 1.42. So take that for what it's what it's worth. We think I, I always think we, we had a buy to begin with and then some of that gets validated when the appraisal comes in. And it certainly gives the bank a higher comfort level with what we're doing. There are this largely is an expense reduction play, not an income increase play. So there'll be a nominal increases to the rent, but it's largely expense in, in management mm -hmm. related. The particular but the avatar of the seller here, you'll get a kick out of this. They own 37 parks. They, uh, the gentleman's partner died in the last two years, somewhere in that range. And so the primary principal has stepped in trying to clean up the portfolio. In his words, clean up some of the dogs. This is the smallest park they own, and it's the only park they own in Iowa. Hmm. Okay. It has been largely mismanaged for a number of years. You guys get a kick out of this. 62 occupied pads last year, garbage. So a dumpster, they spent $56,000 on trash Holy in, in, in the year. Every, so, every blue collar guy with a business on the side is using that dumpster. Evidently. 
It's clear. <laughs> yes, you are exactly right. So for us, it's three line items that shift the value of the park by seven hundred thousand dollars. One is solving the dumpster problem. So how you know? But some of this, the overarching theme is we got to change behavior. It's not just as easy as do something with the one dumpster. Cause we have to. We got to change people, shift some behavior. So there's a new there's a new rodeo, there's a new manager, a new sheriff in town, if you will. So they're gonna uh, people are gonna understand that first with a carrot and this with a stick. But so I'll get to that in a second. Um, but ultimately, the dumpster is going to get solved by eliminating the dumpster, and everybody's getting a garbage can. Mm -hmm. So just like any of a, you know, if you guys live in a house, we all have garbage cans, and that's what everybody's getting. So we've we've sourced that, bid that. The the number we budgeted for twelve grand in year one for our expenses, and that's it should only take us about ten grand or ninety five hundred. But I put some overage in there to go. We're gonna have to change some behavior, so we're gonna have some cleanup. I suspect over a period of time. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's that's the big one far and away. The next one is water. So today the water comes into a singular meter in which the ownership pays right. Water crosses that meter, ownership pays it. From there, there are 62 submeters. So mm -hmm. each of the occupied trailers has its own meter. So ownership pays this one, tenants pay the next one. Well, there's a couple of things. Looking at the line item in the in the in what they ownership paid last year, they paid about $70,000 in water, and they collected about $30,000. <laughs> So you got a delta of 40 grand. Why? So the first thing I do is going, uh, there's, uh, we went to their logs to go, okay, are you not billing enough? What's happening? So we pulled down their logs. Here's exactly what they billed for in terms of number of gallons for the last year. We pulled the water company bills. We're just identifying gallons, right? What'd you bill for and what'd you get charged for? Well, there's a loss of about a hundred to 300,000 gallons each and every month which tells me there's water breaks, underground water breaks that are taking place. So we brought somebody to come in. It's in incredible what they do. They come in, they put this contraption on, and they literally listen to every water meter to identify water line breaks. They mm. can hear water running. So we identified where the location of the breaks are, and our intent is to come in. You know, we've, we've sourced the plumber, got the bids, and shore up those water line breaks along with then I want to make sure there's accurate readouts taking place. So we're going to replace all 62 water meters and put new readouts on all 62 of them so that we're actually, you know, we're getting, we, we stop the leakage and we bill correctly. Sure. So that's the, that's the next one. And the last line item is insurance. These folks have been paying about $16,500 a year in insurance. And we've gone through multiple bids. All our bids, two different vendors, both came back sub seven thousand dollars for coverage. So we pick up, you know, about nine or ten thousand dollars in in savings there. Those three line items alone will move the value of the park in in the first year by seven hundred thousand dollars if we can shore those expenses up. And what's the what's the capex investment you're going to make in order to do that? Hundred and fifty nine thousand six hundred dollars. There you go. There's more. There's more past that, Jack. So. There's a, a communal laundry facility. Today, there's three washers and three dryers there. I've been to this facility about five times now in the last 60 days since we've been under contract. Every time I've been there, two washers and two dryers are broken. Mm. So you're talking about one washer and one dryer serving 62 occupied pads in which roughly 170 people occupy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got a washer and dryer at my house for five people, right? <laughs> I mean, it makes no sense. So. We've got four new washers, four new dryers coming in. This little facility needs, you know, fresh paint, new floor, needs new shingles on the roof. Coin, op coin operated? Coin operated, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yep. And, you know, I talked about changing behavior. There is garbage to the left of each pad, you know, each, each mobile home. There's garbage to the right. There's garbage in the front. There's garbage in the back. Mm. There is trash through this whole freaking facility. Uh, it needs somebody who comes in and can take pride of ownership in this. There's about roughly 60% of the uh, pads are occupied by Latinos, 40% by white folks. Um, but it is clear there is a uh, today in the park, the Latinos take way better care of their, their, their properties. Yeah. Their, their homes look far better. They just take more pride into this. And so we want to extend that pride to the total 
park. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to do a summer cleanup day. We're going to bring a bunch of 40 yard dumpsters into the facility and it's a carrot. Hey, we're going to, we're doing this together. We've got a new community, you know, new ownership. We're going to build this community together. Here's what we need you to do. We've provided these dumpsters. We need you to throw these things away. The stick is you don't do these things. Come day 30, you're going to get fined. I'm going to get you there one way or another. Mm-hmm. And it's okay if you move because I'll find another tenant who's going to actually invest and, and take pride in their community. We're going to, we're going to get people there over a period of time. What are the pad rents there? $433 on average. The most direct comparable down the street, it's a half mile away. The, that, it has twice the number of units. They are very densely populated. They are like on top of each other. Pad rents there are 450 or 455, so slightly ahead of us. And I'm thinking if we get to where we need to go, but we should be ahead of that one. It shouldn't be the other way around. Mm-hmm. So I want to get to the capital raise part of this and yeah. get back to that. But um, one of the interesting things that I find about that asset class, Jack, is when you have tenant owned homes, and they stop paying rent or they're just a problem in the park and you evict them, they're not taking that. They're, they're generally not taking the trailer with them. Not happening because the cost of doing that, if you can find a company that will do it within six months, uh, is exorbitant. You know, we were, uh, when I was looking at a park, uh, about a year and a half ago in Phoenix, um, we we discovered that the cost of moving one of those to your next place of uh, you know you own the damn thing you can move it, um, but it's about fifteen grand, sometimes 15 grand. a little bit more. Yeah, and so that yeah, thing ain't you're, going. You're not, yeah, you, so the, everyone pays because like you're not gonna like you don't have the fifteen grand or when you evict somebody you get a trailer right. Like, yeah, well, it, it gets better. So in most cases, the park owner, if you want to sell that property, Jack. If you want to sell, I own it. I own the trailer. I'm going to sell it and I'm going to go to another park. The park owner has a say in who you sell that, that trailer to. You can't, I can't just call Jack Bevere and say, oh, I've got this great trailer. You want to buy it and live here? No, that Jack Bevere gets vetted by the park owner. So I can't just go sell that thing to anyone. So it's a really interesting, uh, I don't know of any other asset class where you, where, the, where you have that right, but it's an amazing thing. And uh, I think it makes the uh, tenancy pretty damn sticky. So what's the, it, it, forgive, yes, the ignorant, forgive the ignorant question here. Everybody who knows mobile home parks will soon discover that I know nothing. The, um, when you evict somebody for non-payment of pad rent, though, you don't own their trailer. Their trailer is now sitting on your pad, but it's still their personal property. Question mark. That's right. Yeah. And something has to happen over a very short period of time. Otherwise, you're going to take some action against them legally. So what do you, so yeah, so what do you end up doing? Either, like they, say, they, yeah. say they abandon it. Can, do you get possession? Like, do you, do you take, can, sorry, do you get legal possession of the trailer? You're going to have to take some action there. You know, they, these things are owned like car titles, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Not, not real estate. So we've not had that experience. And so we're going to find ourselves, we're going to, we would oh. engage in an attorney. So you can foreclose, For- like For- you, you get like a judgment against somebody foreclosing the judgment and then take, and then repossess the, repossess the. I suppose you can get a judgment against them and then go to, go, go to seek a collection on that judgment against the trailer. Mm. But yep. it, but it's never happened. Or oh well, you only you own that own you own that we own the we own the one for one year. Never never had yeah. that. And then uh, we're we're gonna find out as we get into here because I suspect you know as we as we come down and there's some there's some changes here. Somebody's not gonna make the grade sooner or later, and so we're gonna we will live that experience. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's get into the capital raise side here, and then your yeah. outreach to um you know folks who want to invest with you. What does yeah. that look like for you? Yeah, for us it has been. Uh, this year, we, we've made some changes over last year to this year. This year, it's been me going and having lots of coffees, talking to a lot of people, just telling them what we do. You know, and I always tell them, hey, I, I'm not like a stock worker. I don't have anything to sell you today. And I might not even have an, I might not even an option this year. I'm just telling you, here's, here's what we do. And for, for those who, you know, come along with us, it's because they, they like real estate. They want to be involved in real estate. I'm not going to sell you anything. There's no, there's no hard pressure. Um. And so, and that has turned into a number of referrals to go, you should talk to so-and-so. They like real estate. They want to be in, they want to be in various things or they are in various things. And so it's been a lot of that. And then when we go and have a deal, it's, 
communicating out, it's emailing out to folks. It's having our, our presentation, which we did yesterday, 45 minutes long and going through our, our slide deck to go, here's the opportunity and here's how we're going to execute, you know, on these things. And here's what our, here's what our returns look like. So on a $1.2 million purchase of a mobile home park, uh -huh. um, can you go through what that deal looks like? I mean, is the owner taking back any sort of finance financing, you yeah. know, what does it look like? Yeah. for you on that purchase. Yeah, great question. And so, you know, we're accredited investors only on this deal and, and, and by, by virtue of our raise status, and it gives me the flexibility to talk in as much detail as we're going to go into, sure. just so everybody, so everybody knows from a compliance standpoint. Um, no seller financing. We tried that avenue. So we ended up getting 70% um, debt, meaning loan loan to value at 70% of the cost of the park. Mm -hmm. So we, we pulled $840,000 that way. Bank? Got some... A bank, yeah, bank debt. So interest only for nine months and then 20 year AM. That's the piece, Jack, that you'll notice a lot on the mobile home park, shorter AMs on everything. Mm -hmm. They don't want 25. So want, they want 15s ideally and they'll stretch to 20. What was so the rate? Yeah. Seven and a quarter. So you said oh, for nine cool. months. So that's callable at nine months? No, so, uh, seven and a quarter, three year, three year loan of which nine months is interest only. Oh, I see. Got it. Yep. No, no prepayment penalty because I never going to ask. Is your plan to exit after three years or within yeah, three yeah, years? Yeah, yeah, two to three, year two to three, somewhere in that range. That's the exit. Yep. Can I ask what, like, what, why not just hang position. on to it forever? What, I mean, it could the... be, yeah, I, I think it'll get evaluated, but, you know, the, the intent is to get, to get investors their money back in year two or three, somewhere in that range. Um, well, it's also this going to one, stabilize, like, yeah, for, for as the GP, like, value add deals, you're going to get the most pop by doing that value add and exiting quicker. Otherwise, like, loaning it, owning it long term, you're going to dilute your IRR and make it harder right. to hit your promote. So, like, you know, he, maybe they maybe they recapitalize it into a new entity. Maybe he decides, hey, I want to keep this thing, but he, he would want to recapitalize it into a new entity in different terms so that he yep. can hit his promote on the value add portion. One thing we did on this one is we put in uh, two, two tier structures. So cl cl class A1, A2, $50,000 the minimum, 8% pref. And then we go into a waterfall structure. 8 to 12 is 70, 30, 12 to 18 is uh, 60, 40. On the $100,000 tier, A2, $100,000 investment there, it's 10 pref. And then 10 to 15, it's a 70, 30, and 15 to 20, it's a 60, 40. So we always, I like creating these structures where if you invest more with us, you put more confidence behind us. You know, we're going to, we're going to reward you with a higher return there, higher preferred return, higher, higher, higher levels, if you will. We did put a, uh, an investor buyout clause in this. So, so long as, you know, the A1 hits 18% uh, average annual rate of return, they're in the deal for at least two years and they get all their initial investment back, the general partner can buy them out of their position. And for that second tier, it's 20%. So 20% a year, two years, get your money back. Um, we can buy them out of that position. So Craig, it will be a thought. Can we, you know, do we do a cash out refinance? Do we take the investors out at their, at their return levels come year two or year three, or do we sell it? Yeah, that kind of answers that. Yeah. If you can step in then, then yeah. Correct. Yeah. How much are you putting in? 10%. Mm -hmm. I always say it's 10%. It's a personal guarantee on the loan. Um, oh, you're PG in the loan? Oh, that's a big Yeah. yeah. yeah that's a big and thing. then, you know, if there's a shortfall, I'm always making up the shortfall. Yeah. I write whatever the delta is. Yeah. There's no depreciation on mobile homes, though, right? Very, very. It's not, it's not a lot. On the one in Dubuque, there was a lot because there was private sewer system. Mm -hmm. That ended up getting a lot because that means you're, you're, you're you're depreciating the infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. But when you don't have that private infrastructure, there's not a tremendous amount. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. That's awesome, man. Sounds fun. So it's a small raise, only 600 grand, you know, where we're raising for, um, you know, obviously the down payment, but then we're putting, we're putting money into that and then having some, having some capital held back for reserves. How's nice. it going? Uh, we raised yeah, yesterday. We pitched yesterday. Uh, we only need 600. We raised a hundred and a half in a day. And so I suspect today is, it'll be new, you know, more phone calls, a bunch. I mean, the, the feedback has been very positive. And so 
I had a couple of calls yesterday like, hey, I think we're going to be in, but we're not quite there yet. So we'll, we'll see where we end this week. I'd be pleased if we end up halfway there this week, you which know, has been a significant improvement compared to the previous races. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm very pleased with where we're at. So what's on the horizon for you, man? What's, what, are you, what are you excited about uh, other than this, this particular deal? Oh, hey, Craig, can I, can I, yeah. I apologize. Can I interject one comment on that last subject before? Yeah, Cause it, you, you, I would definitely want to ask the exact same thing you were about to say. I've noticed where I've gotten this feedback. I've gotten some of this feedback and I think I'll also just notice. So like where I was talking about, Hey, all the people who are in these, who are, whose money are still stuck, right. In these, in a lot of like not going Multiple. so well yeah. syndications yep. hasn't fully failed yet, but like, you know, not going that great. Like get, they've been capital called and, or aren't getting aren't getting any distributions right now. So like all that money, right? Like all that money is the folks who normally would have been interested in something this right like this right now, mm -hmm. right? But everybody's like everybody's real gun shy right now. Mm -hmm. Not only are they gun shy like, you know, uh because uh you know, it's a higher interest rate environment and they may not be as optimistic as they was they were before, but their money's stuck dead in this deal, right? In this illiquid investment. And they're like, you know, a lot of them just don't got it, right? Like they're they they're tied up in illiquid stuff, you know? Um and so, yeah, I think that what we've we've we, we've also seen that money that equity is harder to raise, much harder to raise than it was two years ago. Much, much harder to raise than it was two years ago. I think it's a combination of both of those factors. Like some folks do recognize that there is more opportunity right now, but they can't do anything about it because their money's stuck in these three other syndications where they got capital called on one and aren't getting any distributions on the other two. So, what's uh what? What's unique about this one for us is this is our first raise where the property is in Des Moines. The other two that we did last year were both out of state. And so I, I suspect, and we're going to find out you know, when we end, how much does, does the fact that, you know, these are, especially when somebody's first investment with us, hmm. if they're from town, you know, they know, like, trust this city. And then the fact that, They've known me for for extended period of time, and the property's here in town. Mm -hmm. How much does that move the needle for them in in their comfort level for doing a deal? Mm -hmm. And so, there there's a lot of things where I think we're gonna we're we're learning and evolving as we go when it comes to the capital raising, especially when we get to the end of this to go. All right, who do we get money from, and why? Why were they in this deal? Right. Uh, one one quick question before we move on to what you're excited about. Yeah. Um, when you're speaking with folks like this, I would imagine that you know these aren't rich guys or gals, you know, like these aren't like, you know, the, the people that have millions of dollars laying around to, you know, throw at your mobile home park deal. So, you know, talk to the people who are listening right now of like, who is the guy who I'm going out to pitch? And, you know, yeah. I would assume that you have relationships or, you know, of these people either directly sure. or tangentially, yeah. um, talk about that. Like what, what does an average investor in a deal look like this? Yeah. Look like that's them? a, Fantastic question. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm just coming on. I'm thinking about a couple of the different people. I mean, a couple of them are doctors, a couple of them are attorneys, a couple of them are just people who have, who have had solid careers in insurance or in banking mm -hmm. and have just saved over a period of time. And they're, you know, 50 to 70 years old and they want to place some dollars and cents in things that can produce some money passively. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't feel like it's too much risk. A lot of it is, when do I get, when do my first check come? Mm -hmm. I want to make sure there's some cash flow. So we're not, you know, this isn't ground up development. There's got to be cash flow associated with these things. Um, you know, our average check size is probably 75,000. Really? Over the, over the last three deals. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, as you said, it's, these are, normal average people some of the people are in real estate um one segment or another you know sure sure and, and so they've got it they know like and trust real estate a couple of guys that own apartments and so want want other exposure want to place dollars and cents other places as well and some of that is is the fact that it's not easy to find a good deal today yeah and so uh if they've got dollars and cents on the sideline waiting for an opportunity uh, you know, we think we've got an opportunity for, you know, certainly for the right folks. That's great. So, um, yeah, what other kind of stuff are you, um, are you looking at right now? Like you, you, you know, you've sent postcards to different asset classes over the yeah. years. Like, you know, what, what are you sending on right now? 
we're trying to find it, yeah it it has been not it's been challenging right it's been a challenging environment to find an opportunity and i say an opportunity you know uh, you can go buy a market opportunity but it's just not what we're after so we're trying to find something with some value add or you know you, you can buy a deal with that it's got a it's got a pretty high cap rate where you get some yield spread over what you can borrow at and that one's tougher mm-hmm. so yes i mean we're out there in multiple markets uh, every month, building relationships with brokers, expanding the relationships with our current brokers, evaluating deals to try to find opportunities. And at the same time, as you said, yes, we're still outreaching to people um, throughout the whole state of Iowa, trying to uncover an opportunity that, that exists there. Oh, I know what I want to ask you. I, I made a note here. I forgot to look back at it. Um you mentioned in the first podcast episode, I would remind everybody to go back and check that out with Neil, um, self-storage. Yeah. And uh, my my guiding theory is that self-storage is the natural migratory path, it feels like, over the last few years of all single-family guys, because it's amazing flock to that asset. Yeah. And if you talk to every single one of them, at least the ones that I've talked to, there it's all rosy and you know it's it's uh rainbows and lollipops and it's the most resilient asset class uh, recession proof blah 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 and so you said that it, it was your worst performing asset and that uh you know kind of a you, you a little bit of bad taste in your mouth why what what happened there how come you're how come you're the and the antithesis of uh what yeah. the average investor is these yeah. days so I'll uh, I'll tell you I'll answer that and then I'll tell you why I think it's going to be a, a tremendous deal long term and I think I may I may have shared that with Jack in the past from our, our structure of acquisition and so I'll go into that in a minute. Um, it's in Lawrence, Indiana, submarket of Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. It sits, you know, uh, call it a a major thoroughfare, right? Lots of traffic, and right in front of our facility is a strip club. Yeah, yeah. When I first went there, I was like, are, are, "Are we serious, man? Right behind? It's, uh, it's where's it's your niche. where's it's your place? I was throwing my stuff right behind Mustangs. Okay, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> you're going to the self storage facility. Oh, you're going to the self storage facility again? Uh-huh. All right. Where, where have you been, honey? <laughs> you smell like vanilla perfume. You said you were going to self storage. You yeah, have no these- one. You have no one dollar bills left in your pocket. You left with a hundred. Yeah, dude, but they got these Glade plugins in the self storage in each unit. They got yeah. a vanilla Glade each plugin. Unit. Yeah, yeah, that's too good. Uh, so we bought it from a guy who'd owned it for years and years and years, and I got another management play there. He had let me just let people pay when he wants to, when they feel like paying, and they took cash, and so we go in there like it's not happening. So. First, a gate needs to be put on the facility because the gate didn't exist. And then we need to move to electronic. And we're not going to have a person on site. And uh, we actually require people to pay, like, on time every month via, you know, some sort of standard ACH or credit card. And so, you know, 20% of the people either left or didn't pay. How many units is it? It's 15,000 square feet, so call it 150. Okay. About that. Okay. Uh, we We have ground to double the size of it. Mm. but the demand isn't there today to do so. Mm -hmm. Um, That, so yes, I hear all of the self-storage gurus and and the people touting it's recession resistant because look what happened in 08, 9, and 10. You know what happened in 08, 9, and 10 is that a lot of people had to move. Mm -hmm. You know what didn't happen in the last two years? A a lot of people aren't moving. Mm Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of bodies taking place. There's a bunch of people who have been who locked into a mortgage, sub three percent, sub three and a half percent, who probably aren't moving, in my opinion, for quite some time. And you know what they don't need? If you don't move, you don't need a self storage facility. I just think there's less demand as over the course of the last two years for that space than what there has been. And yes, individual facilities vary, but I think overall there's probably a little less. You have a lot of competition in that area. Uh, there's a, I mean, it's, I mean, it seems normal compared to what else is sure to an average place per, you know, if you ran, ran the numbers on a median basis per square foot from a storage facility, we're right inside of an average, an average number there. So you're not excited to go out and find more of that. Uh, I would, I would move in Luke, lukewarm that, you know what? It's a consumer facing business. 
It's a consumer facing business. You have to, when they call, somebody has to answer like now mm -hmm. because they're going to rent something. Um, so it's limping along. It's doing not, I mean, it's not exciting at all. Now, what has me, what has me excited about this, how I, how I think we come out of this and here's, here's how we bought this property for 1.4 million. We put 200 grand down seller financed 1.2 million. The seller financing terms are interest only 5% 20 years. Okay. I think, you know, let inflation, we just limp yeah. along. We need to do a little better. Inflation will do its thing. Yeah. This thing, this thing's fantastic at the end of the day. Yeah. You got, you got 200 basis point head start at least more than Correct. that. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So I think in the long run, it ends up just hunky dory. But today it's, it's like, eh, it's not doing that. It's you, do your, you do your quarterly board meeting there. I assume with your investors, they're you know, uh, doing on site. Stop in for Mustangs. Check out the buffet. Yeah. How are we doing? <laughs> right. Yeah. The food is amazing. The, the food's am the food's amazing. We had a we had a sign issue with like who's got an easement? Where could our sign go? So when we bought the thing early on, this was with a different neighbor. When we bought the thing early on. I became friends. Friends. I, I became on a first name basis with the manager of Mustangs. I've never been there, by the way, but. I call them and we just, oh, hey, Neil. I said, yeah, we just, my intent was, yeah, your guys paint looks pretty bad. How about we repaint your property for you guys? But I need a sign. I need a giant, I need an easement for a sign. They're like, well, we're owned by whoever. I mean, this became like a, like an every week call to go to try to get us a sign easement from Mustangs, which never, never occurred in the end of the day. They wouldn't let you co-brand on their Chrome pole. I was I was like, dude, your purple paint is terrible. Let's <laughs> let's do something special for you guys. You deserve more. <laughs> Mustangs should be elevated. Neil, is there any asset class that you would be like, nah, that's no, nah, I'm, I'm not doing hotel. Uh I'm not to, you know, is there anything that you would say that's just not gonna ever be me? Yeah, strip clubs. <laughs> <laughs> I've given them a lot of plug here today. Yes, you have. Uh, yeah, good question. You know what? We've never done hotels. I'm kind of like quasi curious about them, but not enough. I, I haven't done any, any material effort to go, to go do anything. And that's probably because there's a hotel across the street from me, which is like in bad shape, mm -hmm. um, that is ripe for redevelopment and they own a bunch of ground around them, which makes me go, mm, I wonder if there's an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's an opportunity to, to, to kind of figure that out depreciate it over a period of time make some money as you go and then level it and reposition hmm. so st stay tuned but i'm not i'm not quite there yet um you know there are there are inside of industrial for me i like big giant boxes industrial is all encompassing you know i get i, I see a lot of deals that are uh, manufacturing here in the Midwest, you know, somebody's got a hundred thousand square foot plant, and then they grew and uh, they needed more space, so they they added an L to that and put another forty five thousand on, and then they needed some more, so they cut out another wall and went the other direction, another fifty thousand square feet. That to me is just we're not going to buy it. It's it's functionally obsolescent in my mind because I have zero idea who's ever going to occupy that place mm -hmm. when when they churn out, and the cap rates are going to be attractive, and somebody buys it sooner or later but it's not going to be us. Yeah. Well, man, if uh, people want to get in touch with you, uh, either to uh, learn more about, about the business or to invest with you, how would they find you? Legacyimpactinvestors.com, the absolute best place. Jack, why don't you uh, go ahead and wrap us up here? Yeah, no, Neil, really appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time, man. Thanks for letting us monopolize in so much of your morning. And uh, it's a pleasure as always. Really enjoy the conversation. You got so many interesting experience, so much hustle. So I just I just enjoy. I'm, I'm always excited for the next RIR meeting because I'm like, hey, what'd you buy? Like, what'd you buy? Tell me about the seller financing you got. You know, like what, you know, what are you into right now? And he's always got a story. So I, I love it. I love it. So Jack, you're one of the, the biggest one. brains I know. It's always a pleasure. If I get to spend any time with you, it's, it's a pleasure. So it's, uh, it's my honor to be here with you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Uh, will you be here in July? Uh, unfortunately, I will be out of the country in July, so I, it, it'll be fall before I before I make my way out there. Yeah. Wow. Nice. Where are you going? 
We're going up to Canada and then into Alaska. Oh, sick. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. It'll be fun. Well, man, thanks for taking the time with us. I'll look forward to uh, meeting you over here at 32 South when you come in uh, in the fall. And really, man, it's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks, Craig. Appreciate it. All right, guys.